Let's begin uh, today by reminding ourselves where we've gotten so far in following the journey of genetic information from DNA to proteins. In the last lecture, we focused on the process by which the information found in an organism's DNA, coded as a sequence of bases, is converted into a complementary strand of messenger RNA. Through this process, which we call transcription, we've now gotten a sequence of RNA that has a series of bases specifying a sequence of amino acids in the protein we're trying to build. Let me point out something that might or might not be apparent. The sequence of nucleotides in the messenger RNA transcript is actually complementary to the sequence um, on the strand of DNA from which it was copied. That is, if the template strand of DNA had a sequence A, T, A, A, G, G, C, then the corresponding mRNA would read U, A, U, U, C, C, G, because the RNA polymerase uses complementary base pairing. This is not really a critical point, but it's something to keep in mind if you're ever in the position of trying to decipher a string of nucleotides into a corresponding string of amino acids. You need to know if the string you're given refers to the DNA or the RNA. Usually, molecular biologists refer to the codon for a particular amino acid uh, in terms of the RNA sequence. Now, in today's lecture, what we want to do is to complete our, journey, our description of this journey of information, taking a closer look at the process that we call translation, where the mRNA uh, transcript um, is used as a template for building the protein itself. But before we do that, I want to spend just a moment locating in the cell where these processes are occurring, okay? You remember from the third lecture that the defining difference between the two main kinds of cells found in nature, prokaryotes on the one hand and eukaryotes on the other, is whether or not they have a nucleus. Eukaryotes have a nucleus and prokaryotes don't. The nucleus is where the DNA in eukaryotic organisms is found, separated from the rest of the cell. Prokaryotic DNA is not segregated in any way. This means that in eukaryotic cells, the processes of replication, by which we make more new DNA, and transcription, by which we make the mRNA, must occur in the nucleus, and they do. Translation, on the other hand, the process we're going to talk about today, occurs in the cytoplasm. This simply refers to the rest of the contents of the cell outside of the nucleus or outside of any other major organelles. In eukaryotes, then, the messenger RNA transcript must be exported out of the nucleus before translation can begin. And in fact, if you look closely at the nuclear envelope, you see that there are a lot of little pores. I mean, closely with an electron microscope, a lot of the little pores. And literally, the mRNA transcripts have to be transported through those pores from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm. In prokaryotes, transcription and translation and replication all occur in the same place, in the cytoplasm by definition, because prokaryotes have no organelles. Okay, now the first important thing we need to remember about the process of translation is the fact that here, the biochemical language changes from the language of nucleic acids to the language of proteins. The biochemistry of these two types of molecules is different in many ways, making it trickier for the information to flow across this boundary. The biggest issue we're going to face is to understand how we can establish some sort of specificity on the molecular level that allows a particular sequence of nucleotides, a codon, to be matched up with a uniquely specified amino acid. That's what we want to try to understand. The fundamental way we achieve the specificity that we saw in the processes of replication and transcription, remember, was complementary base pairing. This mechanism no longer works when we're trying to match up nucleotides with amino acids. As we'll see, cells have come up with an extremely clever trick for accomplishing just this task. Now, the process of translation involves three major players, let's call them. And we're going to talk about these three major players in turn to try to understand how translation works. First, there's the message. Second, there's the translator. And third, there's a protein-building machine. It's really relatively simple. Now, of course, the message, we know, is the messenger RNA. Um, this is a long polymer, remember, that has no structure inherent in it other than the sequence of bases, a sequence of bases that specify codons that will eventually be used as information for a template for building the protein. 
The translator is a molecule of a different kind of RNA that we call transfer RNA, or tRNA for short. Now, this is, I say this is a different kind of RNA. It's, it's actually just RNA. It's a relatively short strand of RNA, only about 80 nucleotides long. It's different in the sense that it has a different function. Now, at this point, I want to point out something interesting about how DNA and RNA are related informationally. We've been talking about the information in DNA as being something that codes for proteins, and it does that using RNA as an intermediate. But there also must be sequences on the DNA that specify this other kind of RNA, which has a unique function, acting just as a translator. So transfer RNA is never itself then used as a template for building anything else. It's just a kind of molecule that does this unique function, acting, as we'll see in a minute, as the translator that connects information in nucleotide sequences to particular amino acids. It was Francis Crick. You remember him. He's one of the discoverers of the uh, DNA dub double helix and also the person who originally articulated the central dogma of molecular biology. It was Francis Crick who predicted that there must be some kind of separate adapter molecule to get information from nucleic acids to proteins, and indeed, he was correct in his prediction. Let's take a closer look at the structure of transfer RNA. As I said, this is a short sequence of RNA, only about 80 nucleotides long. Unlike messenger RNA, it actually has an inherent higher order structure, a structure that comes about from complementary base pairing occurring di uh, across different parts of this strand. The shape of this can be diagrammed in a number of ways. The, the what I like to call the road-killed version of tRNA, just flattened out, can be drawn as kind of a, of a cross shape, or it's often called a T. In three dimensions, it actually looks more like kind of a crooked upside-down L. Now, there are two functional ends to a transfer um, RNA molecule, and that's what we want to turn to next. At one end of a tRNA molecule is what we call an anticodon. The anticodon is a triplet of bases that will form complementary base pairs with a codon of messenger RNA. So, for example, the codon or a codon for the amino acid leucine is CUU. The three bases found in the anticodon of a tRNA that will interact with leucine is GAA, the complementary sequence. Now, there's a couple of points to make here. You can immediately guess that it's the anticodon end of a tRNA molecule that's going to be responsible for achieving specificity with the nucleic acid side of this equation using complementary base pairing. The other point is that the anticodon end of a tRNA is variable. That is, there are many kinds of tRNA molecules that are all the same, more or less, except for the three bases of the anticodon. And this is important, of course, because we're going to need a different anticodon for every amino acid that we want to um, bring to the translation process. Now, given that we know that there are 61 codons, remember there are 64 possible uh, combinations of three uh, um, uh, there are 64 possible combinations of four things taken three at a time, and we know that three of these combinations in the genetic code are used as stop codons, leaving 61 combinations that are actually coding for amino acids. So given that there are 61 codons that are functional codons in this sense, you might guess then that there should be 61 different kinds of tRNAs, one for each of the uh, codons coding for an amino acid. In fact, there are fewer tRNAs than this. There are only about 45 kinds of tRNAs. This is because some tRNAs recognize more than one codon, and this invariably occurs when the different codons that a single tRNA will recognize occur in the third position of the codon triplet. Remember, when we looked at the redundancy 